In this video, we will be dealing with another disorder of GIT that is amoebiasis. Now, amoebiasis, as the name itself suggests, that it is caused by an amoeba that is your antamoeba histolytica. Okay, and it is otherwisely or interchangeably also called as amoebic dysentery. Now, why it is called as amoebic dysentery? Because the actual meaning of the word dysentery or dysentery is nothing but inflammation of the intestine causing or accompanied with bloody diarrhea. Okay. Um, one more thing to be mentioned here is that uh, dysentery is amoebic dysentery is a early manifestation of amoebiasis. Now, when uh, amoebiasis is, it, uh, is in its initial stages or it is in its active form. So it manifests as amoebic dysentery. Isle interchangeably these terms can be used. So dysentery is nothing but uh, it is an infectious diarrhea. And diarrhea is nothing but uh, watery stools, watery thin stools which are passed more frequently than often. Now diarrhea is a separate, with, uh, separate topic which will be dealt separately in a video. Here you just have to remember that nothing, uh, it is the inflammation of the intestine that causes your blood streak diarrhea. Okay. Now it is caused by Antamoeba histolytica, which is a protozoan parasite. Parasite because it result, uh, it uh, resides in human body. That's why it is transmitted from one person to other by cyst through orofacial route. Okay. So the mode of transmission is through cyst. Now the cyst is an inactive vegetative form of this uh, organism, this microorganism. And the orofecal root, the orofecal root matlab kya hota hai? Ki when one person passes his feces, okay? So from that person, the pathogen which is present in the feces of one person passes to the mouth of the other person. So that is an orofecal root. Ki from feces, it passes to the oral or mouth of the other person. That is an orofecal root. So obviously, ki ye cause hota hai through orofecal root. So it could be through any kind. Like uh, human excreta as fertilizers or through flies or arthropods or person to person spread or contaminated food or water. So it can pass any way like that. Now these are of two types. Okay, your amoebiasis are of two types. First is intestinal and second is extra intestinal. Now as the name itself suggests intestinal that is involving or affecting the large intestine that is any part of the large intestine or any part of the colon but especially the ileocecal and the sigmoidorectal regions are more commonly involved. Okay. And extra intestinal or hepatic amoebiasis is involvement of the liver. Okay, so amoebiasis which spreads to involve your liver cells or liver is known as extra intestinal amoebiasis. Moving on to the pathology, as you say, the pathogenesis, you say, or the life cycle of this organism. So, ye life cycle bhi hai and it is the pathogenesis of the disease also. So, what happens is firstly, there is Obviously, there is a carrier of this disease who is asymptomatic and he passes out his feces, okay? Now, this feces uh, is contaminated with this bacteria. It has this pathogen. So, uh, uh, either through contaminated food or water or flies, it enters to a healthy person, okay? It enters to the mouth because food ke through ja hai, water ke through ja hai. Kisi bhi tarah se, it is ingested in the form of cyst by a healthy person. Now, this cyst is inhabited in the large intestine, okay? And in the lumen of the large intestine, two simultaneous processes occur. First is X cystation and another is N cystation. Ye do processes simultaneously it occurs in the lumen of large intestine. What is it? So X cystation is nothing but because it cyst form mein ingest hua hai. So X cystation is conversion of these cysts, okay, which is an inactive form to the active form that is trophozoids. And its opposite, matlab trophozoids se wapis cyst mein convert hona is N cystation. Okay, so these two processes are occurring simultaneously within the lumen of the large intestine in a person. So first it is in ingested as cyst, it inhabits the large intestine where their X cystation of the cyst occurs. That is, jo cordial nuclear cyst thi, it liberates its nuclei. So char nuclei liberate hua, unka binary fusion hua, do do mein divide hua, there are going to be formation of 8 trophozoids. Now these trophozoids, they form the active form of the parasite and they, uh, these actively motile trophozoites, they invade the large intestine, their mucosa and they produce lesions. Okay, so they invade the large intestinal mucosa and they produce the lesions. Abhi dekhte kaise lesions produce hote in clinical features aage. 
देन जब ये हो रहा होता है उसके बाद साइमिल्टेनियसली एनसिस्टेशन भी हो रहा होता है सो वेन दीज ट्रोफोजॉइड आर डन विद वर्क दे आर साइमिल्टेनियसली आर अगेन ट्रांसफॉर्म टू द सिस्ट फॉर्म दैट इज द इनएक्टिव फॉर्म एंड देर पास थ्रू द स्टूल विच आर रेडी टू बी ट्रांसमिटेड टू द हेल्दी पर्सन ओके also one thing now this is since it is inhabiting your large intestine so it is obviously the pathology of your intestinal amebiasis agar aap mano when these are present in your large intestine and from there through portal circulation these invade your liver cells or they invade your liver and there they cause damage then it is going to be extra intestinal or hepatic amebiasis okay agar portal circulation ke through it involves your liver or damages the liver cells then it is going to be extra intestinal baki remaining pathology remains the same there also they are going to divide and they uh, they do they going to have that excitation and incitation but if this if this is limited to the large intestine then it is intestinal if it invades the liver then it is extra intestinal starting with the clinical features one more important thing is the type of lesion which is produced by the organism antamoeba histolytica now these clinical features or the clinical signs and symptoms are the thing a person acquires or it shows off when the uh, organism causes the lesions okay so these are the manifestations after the uh, organism is responsible for the lesion so let's see how the organism or how the lesions are caused so this is just a one liner thing which you have to just remember is that these organisms or like antamoeba histolytica it produces typical ulcerations which is known as flask shaped ulcers of the mucosa of the intestine okay so they produce typical ulcerations or flask shape ulcerations of the intestine and they invade the intestine or the mucosa of the intestine by releasing substances like collagenases or immunolytic substances okay and these substances they go into the submucosa and the deeper layers and there they cause histolysis of the cells okay they cause damage of the cells which results in the ulcerations and the abscess formations okay and this is all seen uh, on diagnostic things like if you do a sigmoidoscopy then aapko dikhega sigmoidoscopy mein usually these things are revealed okay now starting with the clinical features of intestinal and extra intestinal so a slight comparative form i have uh, given here so that aapko dono tarah se yaad hai agar is pe note aata hai so you remember it this way i think you will retain it this way more starting with intestinal amebiasis now uh, the trick to learn the clinical features is that you have to run a b c and d you will have to learn like this and after in extra intestinal isko aapko yaad rakhne ke liye you just have to remember the surrounding structures which are present near the liver usse you will get to this clinical features okay starting with the intestinal amebiasis so in intestinal amebiasis like i told you a b c and d a is for appendicitis b is for amoeboma ka b c is for colitis and then is dysentery amoebic dysentery so we will go backwards kyunki maine order ke wise likha hai but then the important ones are this and we'll go this way Firstly is amoebic dysentery which is the initial manifestation as you see when a person is uh, affected with intestinal amoebiasis so that is nothing as i told you dysentery is nothing but infectious diarrhea so there is going to be fever nausea vomiting to be infectious hai aur diarrhea hai to four to eight times stools or loose motions in a day mixed with blood and mucus streaks offensive and sticky now this is going to be dealt in more detail what is amoebic dysentery and its distinguishing factor from bacillary dysentery we will see in the end of the video okay next you have is alternating constipation and diarrhea which is obviously going to be there then you have is amoebic appendicitis okay now as we have dealt in the intro intro part of intestinal amoebiasis that it most commonly involves a ileocecal region okay so if it involves a ileocecal region which is most commonly involved then obviously there is going to be pain in the right iliac region which is going to be matlab it is going there will be going to pain in the right iliac region and why because in that region there is your appendix appendix is present in that area okay and it is invading it is going to invade appendix also so there is going to be appendicitis or inflammation matlab the inflammation is spread to involve the appendix also which is present in your right iliac area that's why amoebic appendicitis okay then you have amoeboma now what is this amoeboma now this is a very rare manifestation of amoebic amoeb uh, of intestinal amoebiasis or you can say a rare complication of intestinal amoebiasis it is nothing but amoebic granulation okay An amoebic granuloma you can say what happens is because of the infection and everything caused by this organism 
there is a mass or there is a collection of granulation there is a colonial uh, granulation tissue formed and this is known as amoeboma or your amoebic granuloma okay so this is very rare manifestation next is non dysentric or post dysentric colitis now colitis the naam hi samajh aa raha hai colitis is nothing but the inflammation of the colon colon matlab large intestine so this is inflammation of the mucus of the large intestine obviously okay so there is going to be necrosis of the mucosa mucosal sloughing ulcerations and bleeding obviously abhi maine bataya lesions of uh, antum and histolytica kaise hota hai to wo to hona hi hai definitely so there is going to be mucosal sloughing ulcerations bleeding okay and these are more commonly seen in children pregnant women malnourished people and people taking steroids or people on steroids okay so these are the clinical features of intestinal amoebiasis moving on to the extra intestinal amoebiasis now two types can be manifested here firstly is when extra intestinal or hepatic amoebiasis as you say like involving the liver so sometimes it involves the liver and there is enlargement of the liver without any abscess formation okay without any abscess formation agar liver involvement ho raha hai liver enlarge ho raha hai so that is known as non separative hepatic amoebiasis ओके ऑब्वियसली सेपरेटेड मतलब वही ना कि कोई स्लफिंग नहीं है कोई नेक्रोसिस मतलब कोई आपका पस फॉर्मेशन नहीं है सो दैट इज गोइंग टू बी नॉन सेपरेटिव हेमेटिक अमीबियासिस दैट इज नो एब्सेस फॉर्मेशन और एक दूसरा तरीका होता है दैट इज अमीबिक लिवर एब्सेस व्हेन देयर इज इन्वॉल्वमेंट ऑफ द लिवर विद द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ एक्यूट एब्सेसेस इन द लिवर दैट इज नोन एज अमीबिक लिवर एब्सेस that is necrosis and separation leading to acute abscess in the liver okay so two types of involvement ho sakte hain non separative and include necrosis with necrosis and separation okay now in this case where there is amoebic liver abscess so your right lobe is more commonly involved as compared to the left lobe and as compared to both the lobes okay so this is the frequency order ki most commonly right lobe is involved second priority is left lobe and third is that both the lobes can be involved now as you uh as this is clear from your head there is liver abscess so there is going to be acute abscess in the liver now you know that your liver is surrounded by many structures above your liver is your diaphragm then you have your pericardium that is your heart ka cavity then you have your peritoneum that is the abdominal ka cavity so all this is surrounding your liver okay liver is surrounding all this liver close vicinity mein hai in sab cheezon se so obviously baat hai ki if the abscess is large enough so it is going to penetrate your diaphragm okay it can penetrate your diaphragm because it is in close proximity with the liver and it can rupture into your lungs or pleura or pleural cavity or the peritoneum that is your abdominal region or the pericardium also if that is the cavity of your heart containing the heart okay and there it can burst and it can discharge of ancovy sauce pus in the lungs okay so ancovy sauce pus is nothing it's a just actually ancovy sauce is a dish kind of thing whitish discharge you can say which is seen in the lungs producing pleural effusion or ascites okay kyunki wo wahan pe dispose of kar dega wahan pe burst off kar dega apna abscess to uski wajah se pleural effusion or ascites bhi ho sakta hai amoebic splenic abscess bhi ho sakte hai this is a rare manifestation it is rare and is secondary to the rupture of liver abscess again this स्प्लीन इज वेरी क्लोज टू द लेफ्ट लोब ऑफ द लिवर ऑब्वियसली सो उधर भी वो रक्चर कर सकती है स्प्लीन को सो इसमें याद रखने जैसा कुछ नहीं इधर आई गिव यू द्रिक दैट इज ए बी सी डी यू हैव टू रिमेम्बर अपेंडिसाइटिस अमीबोमा कोलाइटिस एंड डिसेंट्री ह्यूर यू हैव टू रिमेम्बर द लिवर इट सेल्फ एंड देन द सराउंडिंग स्ट्रक्चर द डायफ्राम द पेरिकार्डियम द पेरिटोनियम स्प्लीनिक एक्सेट्रा cough and pain in the right shoulder because of the phrenic uh, nerve irritation now this nerve is present in your diaphragm area obviously so if the abscess is going to enlarge and it is going to enter to your diaphragm area so nerve is going to be damaged which is going to cause cough and pain in the right shoulder region sometimes tender hepatomegaly may be present which will manifest as pain in the right hypochondrium area jaundice is actually a very rare manifestation and it's not that common nausea vomiting malaise high grade fever intermittent with sweating chills and because everything could be present one more thing is that when you talked about the pathogenesis i made you clear ki pehle jo uh, aapka antamoeba histolytica hai it invades your large intestine and through there it enters to the portal circulation and then it reaches to the liver okay so obviously baat hai if many a times like most of the times if a person comes with extra intestinal or hepatic amoebiasis so he is going to have a history of intestinal amoebiasis okay because start to wahi se hua hai na wo to hona hi hai initial so there may be presenting complaints of intestinal amoebiasis 
Also, uh, a surprising thing to note here is that these are the symptomatic things which happen. But most of the cases of amoebiasis, whether it be intestinal or extraintestinal, they are asymptomatic. 70 to 80 percent of the cases goes asymptomatic. They are just, you know, carriers of antamoeba histolytica. There are no symptoms of antamoeba histolytica in them. So mostly cases are asymptomatic, but these are the symptomatic manifestations if a person is suffering from amoebias. Moving to the diagnosis of the intestinal amoebiasis, so firstly the thing which we have been carrying forward since the pathology we have discussed, that is your presence of active motor trophozoids in those stools, okay. So if the disease in its in, is in its active form or initial form or very acute form, like abhi abhi hui hai kind of, so jo freshly avoided stools honge, aapka jab aap stool test karaoge, so you want to get active motor trophozoids, obviously, okay. When the disease in its fresh form, when the disease in its acute form mainly, and at least three samples of the stool should be examined before declaring a patient as negative, okay. This is very important to remember, eight stool samples you cannot decide actually, that's why. If you do sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy, again I have told you the lesions which are seen, which are caused by antamoeba histolytica are nothing but typical flask shaped ulcers with normal intervening mucosas, okay. So typical flask shaped ulcers will be seen on sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy and when you do a biopsy of these ulcers or you scrape, scrape through these ulcers, so you are going to see trophozoids. Again, in chronic cases, sometimes in chronic cases, trophozoids may not be present. Now you know this because I told you in the pathogenesis or life cycle that uh, the stages that is your N cystation and N X cystation, that is N cystation and X cystation, that is conversion of trophozoids to cysts and cysts to trophozoids. This occurs simultaneously within the lumen of large intestine. Okay. So obviously about the chronic cases hai, so that may also show quadrinucleate cyst. Okay, so quadrinucleate cysts may also sometimes be present in your stools. Moving on to the diagnosis of extra intestinal amoebiasis. So, firstly, clinical diagnosis is done. Here, actually, the clinical features are not that striking. You see, you sigmoidoscopy or stool test, pe jate ho, which give you a very accurate decision. But here, you can see the clinical, you, the, you can do the clinical examination because liver is involved. So, obviously, bath is going to be enlarged. That is your hepatomegaly fever, intercostal tenderness that is within your ribs the tenderness is present. So such presenting features may be a diagnosis of extra intestinal amoebiasis. Otherwise the tests which you are going to do firstly is your stool test which are going to definitely reveal negative for trophozoids or for the organism antamoeba histolytica. Okay? Because either stools, mein, large intestines such as stools are there, pass ho raha tha, to dikh raha tha. But when it moves to liver, to obviously baat is stools mein aai gai nahi abhi hai. Uske baad you blood may because there is an inflammation or infection so there is going to be leukocytosis or raised w uh, white blood cell count. On the chest x-ray obviously now liver is situated on the right side and the right uh, dome of the diaphragm is present above the liver so there is going to be raised right dome of the diaphragm okay and the movement of the right dome of the diaphragm is also restricted when you do a screening on respiration okay obviously baat, the liver enlarged where so, everything that you do will be enlarged and it will restricted movement in the diaphragm. Ka. Also on ultrasonography, what the ultrasonography will give you is the number of abscess or it will confirm you or it, it gives a confirmatory test for the presence of abscess or abscesses by showing or uh, it, it gives you that hyper echoic area. When you do an uh, USD, so it gives you hyper echoic areas to confirm the presence of abscess. Okay, the size of the abscess also they show. And when you do an aspirate of these abscess, so the fluid you get is thick anchovy sauce pus fluid that is bright red fluid you see. So uh, actually yes, this I have mentioned earlier in the clinical features as white anchovy sauce pus. I sweated white so that's wrong. I would like to correct myself, I am sorry for this. But I would like to correct that it is not white, it is bright red in colour. So these are the diagnostic criteria for intestinal and extraintestinal amoebiasis. Moving to the treatment of intestinal amoebiasis, so for treatment in invasive form. Now invasive form is when the trophozoids are present, okay. As we have discussed in the life cycle and the pathogenesis, that trophozoids are the active form of the disease and the cysts are the inactive vegetative form. So when the trophozoids are present, so a short lame trick to remember the medications are, T se aap yaad rakho tindazole because invasive form is not trophozoids present. So T se it is T that is tindazole and when you give the tindazole the organism it takes seconds and it runs with the speed of metro. 
So within seconds, the organism runs with the speed of metro. So seconds say you take sec and metro does all the metro. So here it is. Okay. So we'll do it once again so that you learn it here and here itself. T is a trophozoid that is tinidazole, and when you give tinidazole, the organism takes seconds that is your secnidazole and runs with the speed of metro that is metronidazole. 800 mg, two tablets of 400 400 mg can also be given for three uh, three times in a day for five days. Next is for six cyst clearance or elimination. If a cyst present, then to usko eliminate करने के लिए the best combination is of metronidazole plus diloxanide furoate. And then the preventive measures which have to take care that you have to uh, maintain your personal hygiene and dispose of the stools carefully so that there is no contamination. Moving to the treatment of extra intestinal amebiasis, so the most popular regimen is metronidazole 800 mg three times in a day for 10 days plus chloroquine 300 mg two times in a day for two days and then 150 mg two times in a day for 19 to 21 days. So this is the most popular regimen employed for extra intestinal amebiasis, and this is a sufficient treatment protocol for a mild to moderate kind of disease. Okay, then uh, you can also, in addition to this, you can add diloxanide furoate, that is 500 mg three times in a day, started either immediately with this only, or then after the treatment uh, of metronidazole and chloroquine, or then after that, or then with it simultaneously. Obviously for the elimination of the cyst. हमने यहाँ पे भी ये use किया for elimination of the cyst. So इतना अगर आप करोगे तो you will see that the patient is recovering of the fever, malaise, pain, or you look pain in the liver region and everything. So this is a regimen. Also if there are severe abscesses, then you can go for drainage of the abscess. Obviously you have to aspirate the pus out which are present in the abscess. So if there are large number of abscesses formed in the liver, you can also go for drainage of the abscess. So this is about the treatment of amebiasis, the two types of amebiasis. Now moving on to the last part, that is the difference between amoebic dysentery and bacillary dysentery. So uh, the differences are the six common points are firstly that in amoebic dysentery there are four to eight motions or less than ten motions in a day, but in bacillary dysentery the rate of motions is very high, that is more than ten per day. That could mean even up to twelve per day. Fairly large stools with streaks of dark blood and mucus. Here also, the stools are made uh, mixed with fresh blood and mucus. But here, large stools are present. Here, small amount of stools come out. Okay, the stools are offensive, foul-smelling, and acidic stools. But here, they are odorless and alkaline stools, giving a red currant jelly appearance or a red currant jelly look. The stools are semi-solid and viscid, and they stick to the container or the latrine sheets. Okay, they are sticky as in. Here it could be semi-solid to liquid, so that they do not or they do not stick to the containers or the latrine sheets. Now, microscopically, there are a lot of mucus, but less pus cells and RBCs present. Charcot-laden crystals are present. Trophozoites with ingested RBCs may be present. Now, these charcot-laden crystals, charcot-laden crystals are nothing but hexagonal pyramidal shaped crystals. Which are present as an evidence of a parasitic infection. So where there is parasitic infection, these are an evidence to that, and they are localized in primary granules of the cytoplasm of eosinophils or basophils. But here in bacillary dysentery, the stool they contains numerous or large amount of pus cells and RBCs and macrophages with ingested RBCs, and no charcot laden crystals are present, and few bacteria may be visible microscopically. Also, the last point is that tenesmus is not usual in amoebic dysentery, and in bacillary tenesmus is usual. Now, what this tenesmus is? It is nothing but a cramping rectal pain, and it is a feeling that you need to have a bowel movement again and again. That is, it is a feeling of incomplete defecation when uh, you have a defecation which is not complete, and then you have again and again feeling that you need to go to the uh, bathroom for this defecation again, or you have to. Uh, have a bowel movement, so that feeling again and again is commonly seen in bacillary dysentery, but it is not a common feature of amoebic dysentery. So this is all about the differences of amoebic dysentery and bacillary dysentery. Also, this ends up with the amoebiasis topic. I hope that it is clear from the video about amoebiasis, its several types, clinical features, management, everything. If you enjoyed the video and you understood it, then please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also hit the bell icon so that you are notified every time we upload a video. Thank you so much.